this is machine learning for .NET folks without or with a PhD. Um, and my, come on, there we go. Uh, first of all, before we get started, uh, sponsors always make a conference happen. Um, these are the people who, uh, especially this year, um, provided funding for the conference uh, to make to, to make the ticket cost to make the ticket cost um, to make the ticket cost lower. Um, so please, uh, I understand that um, Hoppin has a facility where you can actually go and interact with these sponsors. Uh, so please, uh, so please do that. So if they know that their uh, sponsorship um, is appreciated and also is uh, worth, uh, so they know their sponsorship is appreciated. So I'm going to go through uh, the <clears throat> obligatory narcissism slide. Uh, just I'll go through this briefly. So I'm Douglas. Hello, nice to meet you. I I met some of you the other day in my uh, JavaScript uh, TensorFlow JavaScript um, workshop. So those of you who came back, uh, welcome back. I'm glad I didn't scare you off too much. Uh, there will be a little bit of overlap because uh, I am going to go through some of the fundamentals of machine learning. Um, that I went through in the in, in the workshop. I'm not going to go to them nearly as in depth, and actually, and, and I explain them a little bit differently. So there 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 will still be there will still be some uh, there will still be some good content there, and then we'll get into um, the APIs uh, using uh, using C sharp. Uh, so I am in Memphis, uh, so I am uh, an hour behind the conference. Uh, I'm a tech author, so um, I am published on Pluralsight, RealPython, and Skillshare. Uh, most most of what I've done is on is on Pluralsight, uh, typically around the data science, machine learning uh, area, but also um, do work on courses with mobile development. So I've got one on Xamarin out. I'm working on one on Flutter right now. I uh, run user groups, so uh, the Python user group uh, having to do with the data science, uh, .NET, uh, Xamarin, and Power Platform. So again, everything's pretty much uh, data and or uh, mobile related. Uh, <clears throat> I put I put this out the other day at the um, at the uh, workshop that uh, if anybody's interested in speaking at one of these, especially during uh, during virtual times. Uh, please reach out to me. I'll put my uh, Twitter and uh, email up at the end. As I say, our plea for speakers is continuously open. Uh, I also help organize conferences. Uh, so Scenic City Summit, this is one that uh, actually was scheduled to be today in Chattanooga. Uh, that was before you know what happened. And now we are working to facilitate this as a um, virtual conference uh, later in the year. So uh, if you look up Scenic City Summit online, uh, keep an eye open for that. And also another one that I'm <clears throat> that uh, that I'm helping with this. This one is going to be virtual. This one's going to be October the 3rd. And in fact, I'm going to go ahead and plug it here. PDEV Con. Uh, so it's going to be Saturday, October the 3rd. Uh, it's one day. It is free. Uh, so you can go to this link here. This link, if, if you tried to click this link the other day and it wasn't working, it is now working. Apparently, Bitly does not like it when you put trailing slashes at the end of URLs. There's a reason why I'm not a web developer. And then just to let you know, here are some of the here are some of the people that we've got speaking. Uh, so a lot of these are actually speaking here at Code Palooza. Uh, Sam just finished up his session. Ed's here. Uh, Chris. Uh, Chad is the organizer of Code Palooza. Uh, Matt Groves. Um, let me see here. I know that. Uh, Sean's here, uh, David, who did the keynote yesterday. Um, so these and much more. And I've actually got about two or three more that aren't on the list yet. I haven't had a chance to update it this week. But um, go, go check, go check it out. I think that I think we're going to have a really, good, I think we're going to have a really good time here <clears throat> on um, <clears throat> on the third. And then. Last but certainly not least, uh, I am a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional in Developer Technologies. First year being awarded, and I hate it that I have to on, rearrange my windows <clears throat> uh, for Developer Technologies. And um, that's probably more than you wanted to know about me. And this right here is a is a problem with the slide. Okay, so we, so pretend you didn't see that. 
Um, but what I was going to, I was going to start off is something like this. Now, this would, of course, in C sharp, be inside of a class. But let's pretend that this, that this function again. Don't, don't, don't look at this part down here. Let's pretend that this function f or this method f is inside of a class, and it's pretty obvious what it does. It simply takes its input and returns one greater than that input. Well, if you look at this one, now the completed one, what does this do? Well, if you look at it, and you can, you know, we could start off by, it's either, add, it's either adding or subtracting one a whole bunch of times. So if we count one, two, three, four, five times it adds, and one, two, three, four times it subtracts, it's actually still doing pretty much the same thing here. The, the end result is the input uh, in, in, increased by one. So if I were to call these both with the same inputs, I would get the same output. The point of all this is that these have the same output, but they're taking different paths to get there. This is a concept that I want you to keep in mind as we start to discuss the fundamentals of machine learning. Okay, so I uh, take a step back first, and we're going to look at uh, this field called artificial intelligence. And this is actually machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence sounds like we're training the robots to to eventually take us over. And it, it's absolutely, you know, it's nothing, it's nothing like that. It's nothing scary. Um, in fact, we are not even trying to mimic human intelligence. We don't understand human intelligence well enough to be able to mimic it with code or anything else. Instead, the goal of artificial intelligence is to mimic human response. Okay. Again, that the, the, the previous slide with the with with the route with the scenic route to getting uh, to just adding one to a number and mimicking human response. Let's try to mesh those two together. So, um, at one time, what we had was we had this uh, thing called an expert system. And so what you would have is you would have, say, an expert, so a mathematician, somebody who's an expert in math, and then you would have a programmer over here. And the mathematician would start to tell the programmer what they know. So, so for example, very simple example, but uh, to calculate the, two, the sum of two numbers, add them together. And then the programmer would translate that into something that the, that the computer could understand so that if you, so that when the uh, expert system was given two numbers, uh, and said, hey, sum these two numbers, it would know, hey, I just need to add them, I need to add them together. And you said, uh, what's the difference of these two numbers, it would know to subtract them, what's the product, and so on. Now, the point behind all of this is that when the programmer is, 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 is explicitly doing this, what's happening is the rules are manually discovered and created. And there are lots of problems with this. I'm not going to go into them today for, for time reasons, but keep this in mind that what we were that our first attempts at artificial intelligence, we were manually creating rules. Now, somebody now, like I said, there are many problems with this, and some and some people and uh, somebody recognized what they are and said, "Hey, I'm going to try to build a better mousetrap." So they came up with this idea of machine learning. Now we'll get into what now we'll get into some kind of a little bit under the hood of machine learning here in a minute, but. Keep in mind that machine learning is still artificial intelligence. So we're still trying to mimic human response, but instead of explicitly creating all of the rules and discovering all of the rules, we're going to say is without being explicitly programmed. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the machine or the computer or the algorithm or whatever, we're going to let it discover all of the rules itself for whatever we want to do. So let's take a look. At our, at our at our sum example again. So instead of saying to sum two numbers, you add them together. What we're going to do is we're going to throw some examples to the machine, okay? And we're going to split these examples into two, this 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 table here. We would we split it into two parts. So we would say there's a relationship between this part of the data set and this part of the data set. Now we call these the features and the targets, all right? So what we want to do is we want to have a system, a machine learning uh, system, or we'll, we'll see here in a minute, it's called a model, but that when you feed it three and four, it returns seven, eight and two, 10, okay, and so on. Now, we're gonna feed this through some kind of a machine learning algorithm right now, don't worry what that is, and we're going, and this is what we're gonna come up with. We're gonna come up with something called a model. 
This is called training a model. And I like to say that, the that a model is a mathematical representation of the knowledge, in quotes, as derived from analyzing training data. And this up here would be the training data. Now this model, what we want it to be able to do is be able to take new data and give us and give us an accurate response. So in this case, six and three, we would get nine. Now, here's the thing. Look inside of the, keep in mind how the programmer for our art for our early art for our early artificial intelligence system came up, uh, told the computer how to sum. Now, if the computer dis discovers it itself, it may come up with something like this. Okay. Here's again, here is the idea. They both would arrive at the same answer. It's just in different ways. So if we were actually trying to mimic human intelligence, we would expect the computer, we would expect the artificial, <clears throat> uh, the model to just say six plus three or three plus four instead of something that's more roundabout. Now, in reality, the models are just a big glob of numbers and um, we aren't meant to see what they do. But I want to get that I want to get that point across that regardless, we're trying to mimic human response. OK. All right. Let me see here. Uh, 10, 11. Hey, that didn't take me long at all. OK, good. Maybe we can talk about some more cool stuff today. OK, so I want to. So um, there are a number of ways right now that you can do machine learning. Um, a lot of them have to do with Python. And so there in there. So, for example, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, and then some of the data science libraries such as NumPy and Pandas. And there are actually .NET bindings to those libraries. So you could actually write uh, C Sharp code that uses the TensorFlow API or the Pandas API or something like that. Now, the problem with that is that those APIs are designed for Python. And your code comes out looking like Python with some C Sharp syntax. Now, of course, in uh, now, of course, as .NET developers, you um, you, you, you you've learned you've learned to think in a more object oriented fashion. You've learned to think there there are certain idioms that um, there are certain idioms that .NET code or C Sharp code has. So, um, and that's what ML.NET is trying to do. ML.NET is trying to allow you to um, use those 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 idioms and such and also take advantage of the uh features of this of for example the c-sharp language whereas the or as tensorflow and scikit learn are going to take advantage of features in the python language so let's take a look at how ml.net is going to do this so first of all you saw that we had the features and the targets um in something like uh, in, in something like uh in many python situations these would just be raw data sets but inside of ML.NET, again, like I said, we're used to operating in a, inside of .NET. You're used to operating in a more object-oriented fashion. So what we're going to do is we're going to take features and our features and targets are going to be represented as classes. And this is something that's built into ML.NET. So, for example, um, the first example that we're going to look at here is predicting housing prices based on the size of the house. And so here, here would be here would be the two features that we would have: uh, the size of the house and the price of the house. Now, what we want to predict is the price of the house. So we're going to have a, another class that's going to be our that's going to be our prediction. All right. So this is how so this is how we're going to structure our data set, how we're going to uh, prepare our data set, so to speak. Now, um, the next thing we would new, need to do is we need to get something called an ML context. And everything in ML.NET is going to start from an ML context. So we would just create one of those very, very um, straightforward here. Uh, bring in some data. So there's this thing called a uh, training view. So here, so this first example, just going to uh, take those house data classes, make a whole bunch of them, and then we're going to uh, get them into an iData view. And there are a number of ways to do this. So here we're just loading from an enumerable. Later on, we'll see how you can load from a text file, and you can bring in from other you can bring in from other data sources as well. And this so this is going to be our data source. Now then, what we're going to do is we're going to say what how many of the what what are the um the features what are the features that we want to use to actually make predictions so in other words this is going to be called our feature vector in other words now in this case there's only a, there's only a single one later on we'll see an example where there's a few more uh we'll select an algorithm don't really worry about what the algorithm uh means right now but 
what we're doing here is we're, um, one of the things we're telling it is up here, we said, here are the features that we're going to use. And down here, this label, the target is sometimes called the label. This is what we're going to try to predict. And we're going to use this algorithm to do it. And this maximum number of iterations is, is basically um, how hard we're going to work to train it. And all of this goes, <clears throat> excuse me, goes into something called a pipeline. All right, let's keep going. Then you're going to train the model. Now, training the model may sound like this is where the rubber hits the road, and it is for ML.NET, but your, but your job is easy. Simply call fit on the pipeline, pass it your training data, which is that, um, which is that iData view, and it's going to do its work, and it's going to return that model. And that model is what you're going to use to uh, predict new prices. So we'll create uh, or make new to the model is what you will use to make predictions based on new data. So here we could create a um, some test data. We only have to provide the size because the price is what's going to be returned. We'll create a prediction engine. Now this prediction engine takes the model or this create prediction engine uh, method takes the model that we're going to that that we trained. However, what it, what it wants to know also is what's my input, what are my features going to be, what's my output, my prediction. So it's typed on that. And then we will um, be able to call predict on the prediction engine, pass it in our test value, and we'll get back, um, and we'll get back, so and we'll get back results. There, there's another way that you can do this, is that you can also load a um, load more, do this in batch, load more than one test variable. So here again, we have another, um, we have an array again of house data objects load those in from an enumerable, and we could also call model transform and pass in an entire data view rather than just make a single prediction. And uh, then we have some, we have some, uh, have a number of different uh, methods that we can use for evaluating this. Uh, so in this case, uh, using the regression evaluators, and again, saying our, um, here, here, are, here are the predictions that were made and what we're wanting to evaluate is the, um, is the price. And then that'll give us some uh, that, that'll give us some some metrics. In this case, uh, the root mean squared error. That's <clears throat> kind of a and, and the thing is, what you're going to see is you're going to see that this that this is a pattern that is followed throughout ML.NET pretty closely. Uh, now, this particular example here to is something called regression. And you may know what uh, may have heard what regression is in the past. But just for a little refresher, if you have some data like this, what you're trying to do is you're trying to find a function. In this case, it's just a linear function, but it doesn't have to be, that um, best fits this data. In other words, what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize the distance or the error <clears throat> between each of these data points and this line. Okay. In other words, what we're trying to do is we're trying to approximate a function which best fits the training data. Now, with regression, um, these... Uh, these the outputs or the predictions are continuous. So in other words, um, it could be 1.1 or 0 0.234 or 100.89134567472 or whatever. It there, <clears throat> like I said, it's a continuous value. Okay, so that is the first one. Let's go ahead and look at the demo for that real quick, just so that you can see this in action. Can that model be dumped? Yes, Calvin. Hold that thought. You're way ahead of me. But we will. But yes. But yes. It. But sh long story short, yes, it can. Uh, and I've got an example of that here in a minute. And just and just out of curiosity, I didn't show it the other day, but you can dump the models from TensorFlow.js as well. Okay. So let's open up. Uh, this is the one. Did I? Is this the one that I made? Is it? Yeah, this is it. Okay. So what you're going to see is, um, <clears throat> so what you're going to see here is this is actually basically the example that we just had. Now, um, one thing to note. So if you look over here in the project file, and this works, and, and one other thing is that ML.NET, you can use it with .NET Core. So uh, I actually created all of this stuff on a Mac in this morning. Just send it over. Just just send it over to uh, just send it over to my PC. 
And so and since it's .NET Core, it'll work in Linux as well. It'll work in Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio, Atom. Um, I don't know if anybody was in my in my session yesterday morning where I was talking about uh, cross-platform .NET Core development. But because it's .NET Core, you're not limited to any one particular tool or, uh, or platform. But however, <clears throat> one thing I do want to point out is uh, this right here. The... Um, so the packages you would use is Microsoft.ml, but uh, not ML.net, but um, the version 150. Right now, the current version is 151. However, I get, I've had some really bad issues with 151, and um, I haven't had a chance to look into them yet. But uh, there'll be things uh, I get crash exceptions for no explainable reason. I get some really, really inaccurate results sometimes and that and these things do not happen with 150 so if you go out and start looking at examples and things are going weird check your version and um just and just see that it's 150 some of them are i've seen some examples that are still using as far back as 13 but at any rate <clears throat> so but this is just the just the same um why in the world is this that's weird um but at any rate uh, so here is our, here are our two, um, what we're going to use to predict and what we want to predict. Uh, here again is our ML context. We've got, uh, four examples for our training data. Normally you would use many, many more, load those in from an enumerable, uh, here, start creating our pipeline, um, fit the training data to create the model, create a, uh, create a test, create a test value. And then use that to create a prediction engine on which you're going to predict a new value and then spit it out. So let's see what happens. Let's do a .NET run. And it's going to tell us 200, about 276,000. Now, if I run this again, <clears throat> notice that I don't get the exact same value. And you're going to notice that if I keep running this, is that it's always going to come out around 275,000. Okay. And if I were to, I don't know, say, I don't know what, what, let's see, what's a good number to probably use 1.8. Yeah, no, let's, let's do 2.0. No, hold it. I'm trying to think what was the one I used earlier. It was a good one. 3.1. I think that worked. That was a good one. Look at this. We're, we're coming out, of course, with a different value. But <clears throat> again, notice we're not coming out with the same value each time. But we're coming out with something that's in the area of 335 to 340,000. Again, like I said, this is an approximation. We're never going to actually get the exact right, the, the, the exact perfect answer. Uh, but we will get something that's generally close enough. And OK, good. I'm keeping up with the chat. So that is, again, very very simple example of how um of how of how this works we'll look at a more complex example a more perhaps real world if you will example in a minute but first of all let's talk about what is represented in that example <clears throat> so uh regression is one of kind of the two killer apps for machine learning but there's another one and i've got two readjust my windows again called classification now classification it <clears throat> does somewhat what the name expects but here's the here's kind of a more formal definition let's say that you have <clears throat> a bunch of data okay each of these little rectangles represents say a feature vector and uh, each one of these data each one of these points has a particular class or label category um, here we have three of them, labeled A, Q, and Z. Well, the idea is that of classification is we want to assign a label to, to each data point or each piece of data. And what we're going to do is we're going to train a model to do this so that when a model sees a piece, sees one of these, uh, sees one of these pieces of data, it puts it in the correct, in the correct um, class, or in this case, bucket. All right. And this is the other kind of, like I said, killer application of machine learning. Now, there are two types of classification, and this is something that uh, is a little bit confusing sometimes. They both do the same thing. They both assign labels to data, but we have binary 
classification and multi-class classification. We're going to see examples and we're going to see examples of both. Um, <clears throat> okay, so binary classification is what is when you have two classes. So cat, not cat, hot dog, not hot dog, um, just, just two because binary, of course, means two. Multi-class is when you assign one of more than two classes. And the reason this is confusing is because binary uh, is because multi-class is multi generally means more than one and binary is more than one. But in this case, with binary classification <clears throat> is exactly two. Multi-class is, of course, more than two and single class classification wouldn't make much sense because everything would have the same answer. OK, so with classification, what what does the a little bit of a kind of a synopsis of the code? And then, <clears throat> excuse me. So model training is involving a random at some point. Um, yeah, Calvin, it's kind of like what I was talking about the other day. You're, you're, you're going to start off. <clears throat> you're, you're, yeah, you're going to have to start off with some type of randomized value for your for your model, because um, and now, again, with the toy examples that we're working with today, it's, it, w it wouldn't make much difference. But randomized values are actually going to be going to be more efficient in the long run with real world problems. It's, it's a mathematical thing that I don't really have time to get into, but it does. Um, because, but, but the thing is that let's put it, look at, look at it this way to be kind of simple. The real world, a real world problem that just occurs naturally things like, uh, so, so for example, uh, uniform distributions in statistics where basically every value in a range has a roughly equal value of, uh, roughly equal probability of being selected. Those don't exist, really. Those are the, those are you know like sine waves. Pure sine waves don't exist. But we can what we can do is we can break down any arbitrary wave, for example, into a composition of different sine waves. So uh, things like sine waves and um, and random you know and uniform just these are these are things you know sine waves. This is something that human beings invented to make ourselves feel smart, if you want to think of it like that. But um, but but again, the real world is not so pretty as to be you know, like a nice, like, again, like a nice straight line or something that you can easily, that, something like that. It, it's going to be something that's more, that appears to be more random to us. Um, I hope that made sense. It's probably a terrible explanation. But anyway, let's move on to, to a synopsis about classification. Uh, so again, you're going to start off, you're going to start with an ML context. Okay. You're going to load some training data. Now, in this case, loading the data in from a file, because there's going to be more of it. But uh, th that file, in this case, now with the enumerable, we didn't have to we didn't have to do this. But in this case, uh, with the load from text file, we're going to say this is the structure of the data that's in that, that that's in this file. Or rather, we want you to, or really, I want you to take the data in this file. And that actually probably should be a, that's actually should be a T because this is a uh, tab separated value. But anyway, when we see it in the code, um, I want you to I want you to uh, store the the points in this file in a class in the type of this structure. We're gonna create a pipeline. So we're gonna go through all those transforms. We'll talk about that more in here in a minute. And then what we're going to do is gonna select an algorithm. Again, uh, this time, just like before, we're just going to uh, say, okay, where, wh what do we want to predict? What are we gonna to use to predict it? Train the model, we'll call fit on the training data. Again, that'll give us a model. We'll create a prediction engine. Uh, it actually should be on Two prediction there's actually two classes there but you, like you said you saw that before uh and you might you might be seeing at this point hey i've seen this you know i've seen this movie before and that's what i was talking about before with with ml.net it kind of puts net and even c sharp idioms into uh and put in uh, puts them into a machine learning or makes it possible so that you can use them in a machine learning workflow um the main difference between any of them is you're going to have things, the algorithms and the evaluation metrics. So for example, uh, if you look at all, if you go into the documentation here, let me see if this, uh, come on. If you go into the documentation and uh, you've got all these different algorithms. So you've got algorithms for uh, li linear algorithms, um, all different kinds of algorithms that you can use here. And you can read through this on your own and see uh, and, and, and see how to and see how to use them and stuff because there's all but there my point is there's a whole bunch of these and the way that you uh get to them is basically basically the same um let's go over here now and also the metrics what you use to figure to evaluate the performance of your of your model again 
a whole bunch of different ones at this resolution, this high resolution, uh, or rather, I guess, low resolution. It, it, look, it looks really bad. But, um, but for example, for binary classification, or then you've got different ones for multi-class classification, and then you've got some for, re for, for regression, and then also other tasks that we'll briefly look at here in a minute. And then <clears throat> all the transforms. When you create that pipeline at first, you're going through and doing transforms. This is basically preparing your data for um, to be consumed by ML.net. And these, there's a whole bunch of, there, there's a whole bunch of these. So um, over here, um, doing things like uh, converting between data types, normalization and scaling. So uh, let's see here, what's a better one? You know, converting between data types. So if you want to uh, map, uh, map values to different labels and, and such text transformations. We'll see this here in a minute, featureizing text to turn to turn uh, text into mathematical vectors or numerical vectors rather that um, that uh, ML.net is more interested with. How do you handle missing values when you've got a real world data set with millions or even billions of um, of rows and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, you know, at least tens of columns, you know, take the product of that. Or if you're, you know, getting sensor data in and you have a dropout in the sensor, you're going to have missing values. How do you handle those? Um, how do you, it could be something as mundane as uh, renaming the features. Uh, it could uh, computing new values from exist from existing values. Um, in, in all of this, and actually this, this part here with the, all these transforms, this is actually where you can, sp this is actually, I'm not going to say where you can spend a lot of your time, but in a real world problem, real world problem, this is where you will spend most of your time. Um, and ML.net has taken the most common tasks and maybe even a few non, not so common ones. Uh, you know, so like for here, like for image transformations, you know, in Python, you would have to do a lot of this stuff by hand or go out and find a, you know, go or go out and get, uh, use something like pill um, to, um, to, do, to do these kinds of things for you. This is, this is all batteries included with ML.net. And I'm not putting down Python, you know, I'm not putting down my beloved Python for, for, for a second. But again, I'm just saying that uh, ML.net makes all this possible within a, uh, within a .NET context. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and let's take a look at the next demo. And this one's a little more involved. And actually, these demos, uh, you can find these demos on in, in Microsoft's GitHub. I kind of, I just kind of modified them uh, to make them easier to read. What Microsoft does in, in, the, in, GitHub, in the GitHub repo, they have uh, split these out. Uh, organize them differently, but it doesn't make it but doesn't make it really easy to read through the code and see exactly what's going on. So let me kill this, or not ready to kill it, but close it. And how am I doing on time? Okay, good. I'm doing good on time. Let's open up. I think this is what I called it. I have a terrible time naming projects. Yes, this is it. And I want to delete that. Okay. That was from the test run I did earlier. Okay, so let's take a look first of all. <clears throat> I actually take a first look. First of all, take a look at our data. So um, this is a tab separated value file, and what these are? These are GitHub issues. Um, or what these are? So you've got uh, basically and for uh, for .NET is what it is. And so you what you have? You have an area here. So like for uh, this particular issue has to do with system XML. This one has to do with system numerics. And we've got uh, geez, system text here and so on. And then we have um, a title for the um, for the issue. And then we have the description here of the issue, which can be quite long, so long that I lost my cursor. Uh, but anyway, you get you 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 get the idea. And <clears throat> what I've got here is I've got some for that we're going to use for training and then some here that we're going to use for testing exact same format uh, that we're going to use to validate the performance of the model later on. OK, here's the guts of the code. So, like I said before, the um, the issue itself has um, has four properties, the ID, uh, the area, which is what we're trying to predict, and then the title and description, which is what we're going to use to make the which is what we're going to use to make the prediction. So this, so this is our feature vector. Um, and then what we're trying to predict again is the area. Now these attributes, these are provided by ML.net uh, for certain things like, uh, in, for example, this load column attribute. It specifies what the order of the um, of the uh, of these uh, columns in the issue class should be. Okay, here in the uh, so here in the actual uh, application, we're going to pull in our um, 
you're going to tell it what our training and test data sets are going to be. Start off, we're going to create an ML context. Again, just like we saw before. Um, here is the, here's where we're loading the uh, data in uh, from the, from the TSV. So use load tech, uh, use load from text file. We're going to uh, say we want to store this data in a GitHub issue. We're going to use, we're going to use the data from the training path. And in this case, if you, if you noticed, um, oh, come on, right. That this has a head, that this has a header. Uh, has a header row in it so we're going to so we're going to use the so tell it that that first row is not part of the data we did do some different transformations i'm not going to talk about these in in detail but um for example in this case we're going to say map value to key we want to actually have we want to actually internally um interpret that uh that column area as label sometimes the target is called is called the label then this is what i was talking about before this featureized text transform uh, we're going to take the title and the description, which are which are text, which are string, and we're going to featureize them. And featureizing basically means when you take a string of when you take text and turn it into some kind of a numerical vector, uh, because machine learning doesn't like words, it likes numbers. Because machine learning is just math, lots and lots of math. <clears throat> and then we saw this before here, where we're taking our features, and so now our features instead. So while I said before the features of the title and description, they're actually the featureized versions of those. And we're going to take that and put it into uh, and say, basically, this is our feature vector. Uh, this is just a performance optimization here. <clears throat> OK, um, we're going to use a, uh, a multi-class trainer, the trainer, uh, th because the, the trainer trains an algorithm, trains a model, basically, is what this is saying. Don't worry about what this means right now. Like I said, you can, this is just the name of the algorithm that we're using. But what do we want to predict? We're wanting to predict the label and the label. Real world has hair. It's fuzzy. <clears throat> not sure. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're going there for there, but. <clears throat> um, so back up here. We remember that we re, we re, that we mapped the area to a label. Like I said, this is sometimes it can be just just as mundane. Um, pre preparing your data can be just as mundane as um, as renaming the columns. So this is what we want to predict. This is what we're going to use to predict it. And um, from earlier discussion, okay. Uh, and then do some more things. Here's our. Here, so we're going to take that training data that we loaded in from the TSV file. And we're going to uh, we're going to fit it to a trained model. We're going to create a prediction engine. This time, what we're going to use to make the predictions are the issue, and what we're going to use to uh, what we want to predict are the predictions. What we're going to want to what we want to predict are the uh, issue prediction class. Pass it that model. Then what we can do is take a is create a new one. So we're going to provide again. We all we have to provide are the are, are the feature are the feature vector, which is the title and the description. It'll it'll vector it'll featureize it for us. Take the prediction, create the uh, predict the issue, and the rest. Oh no 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 yeah that's fine. And uh, create the prediction, print out the area from the prediction. Then what we're going to do is take the um, the test data path, which again has the exact same format as the training data, so we can use the exact same uh, method to do that. And what we're going to do this time though is we're going to uh, is we're going to evaluate them in batch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use is I'm going to use the transform method instead of the predict instead of the just the single prediction engine. That'll give us um, that'll give us a whole bunch of metrics overall, not necessarily the specific predictions, but the, uh, just metrics overall. And I can print and I can print those out. And then we'll get down to some of this here in a minute after we run .NET run. Okay, so this is going to take a few seconds. Because what it's doing is I forget, let's see here if we can, that because the reason this is taking a few seconds is because if we look over here, you know, before we just had four very simple um, pieces of data. Now we're going through about 13,000. And even this, like I said earlier, you know, you have millions or even billions of rows. Um, this is actually a toy data set. But anyway, any rate, <clears throat> so we've got our results back and says the predicted area is system dot, uh, is system dot net. And if you look up here, we're talking about web sockets. That's probably right. Okay, because web sockets signal R. That's probably right. 
Uh, now, if you look down here, you can see that we're getting we're, we're getting some uh, we're getting some results. I'm not going to go into these in, in depth. Basically, you you want these numbers to be as close to one as possible. Eh, could be better here. Uh, so in this could be better here, but it's actually good enough for this example. Now, you noticed that this took quite a while to train, uh, even with this toy data set. So, you know, multiple, you know, that's 13,000 rows, multiply that times about 100. OK, and you're going to be at 1.3 million rows, um, <clears throat> you know, and, 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 and just in and, and, and the training time is going to go up from there. Well, um, you don't want to do that every single time. And of course, you don't want to every time you make a prediction, retrain the model. It's going to take a lot of time. It's also going to cost you a lot of money, uh, especially if you're running in the cloud. So instead, so what we would do, we can save is we can save that model out. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just taking the train to a file. And so I'm just going to take the trained model here, uh, the schema, which is the, um, of course, which is the structure, uh, metadata about the structure of the, of the data, and then a file name. So I'll run that again. And it'll take a few seconds. If you watch over here, you'll see that model.zip file show up. I'm doing 1041. Okay, we're doing okay on time. Okay, got the same thing, but if I refresh, oh, you're kidding. Where did, oh, did it put it in here? What? Oh, dear. Did I, uh, I swear this worked earlier. Um, okay, well, I, I guess what? I actually have a plan. Because in case something like this happened. Hang on, I'm doing some work behind the scenes. Come on, give it to me. Thank you. Okay. Oh, hang on. I think I see my problem. I don't think I, I didn't. Hang on, just a second. Let's try this. Let's try this real quick. I may actually have. I think I didn't save my file. Maybe that's what happened. Don't you love live demos? Let's try this one more time. There we go. Okay, I didn't save the file. Okay, always save your files, folks. Um, <laughs> okay, but at any rate, this is what we're looking for now. What I can now, what I'm going to do is this is, of course, kind of a kind of a little bit of a hack. But okay, so I'm going to need this um, and uncomment this. Okay. So now what I want to do is I want to uh, load that model in. And after that, I can use it just like I would my train model before. So I'll create an issue, create a prediction engine, predict on that single issue, print out an area. But notice that this time, and I will save my code this time, it takes a lot less, well, it takes a lot less time. And it gets to predict, and it, um, predict system data this time. And if we're talking about entity a problem with entity framework, that's probably going to pertain to system data. Okay. Uh, so that is kind of a more real world. And like I said, even these are toy examples, but if I, but if I use, but you know, real world models can take, you know, days to train. And so I don't, you know, look how long we had to wait to, for that one. Okay. I got 15 minutes. That's awesome. All right. Let's go back to the slides real quick. And let's talk about a few other small things here. Okay. So, um, oops, let's do this. All right. Um, 
so other things that you could do, uh, clustering, this is what this, this is, you know, the, what we've seen here are called, uh, so far have been called supervised learning, where you tell the uh, algorithm, hey, here's what's interesting about this, about this data that I want you to look into. Clustering, you basically give it the data and say, discover what the commonalities are about this data. You, you tell, you tell me what's interesting. So it'll put it into different groups based on the commonalities between the data. Anomaly detection, pretty much what it says, uh, you know, what, what, which of this data does not belong. Uh, ranking also pretty much what it says, uh, determining the best order for for um, for for, for uh, points in the data. Recommendation, you know, think Amazon. You know what what you bought this item. All these other people also bought this item. Here's what they liked. You might like this as well. Forecasting, uh, dealing with things like time series data, so uh, text generation, stock market, weather, um, and uh, you know financial data, that kind of thing. So, but these are other things that you can that you can do, and, you, and like you saw, and like I was showing you with some of those algorithms and the evaluation metrics, you saw uh, some of these categories over there as well. Uh, another thing that you can do is not only can you uh, bring in models that you saved in the mill.net, you can actually bring in models from uh, other places as well. It's something called uh, transfer learning, and the reason why this is important is because for many problems, especially when you get to think for things like image recognition or uh, uh, text analysis, there are humongous models that have been well trained and refined over the years, and uh, they're they're going to be able to uh, they, they've saved you a lot of work, uh, and many of these are many of these are out there openly avail available in the open. So a pre-trained model, you you know, is, like I said, is going to save you a lot of work. And transfer learning uses these as a starting point. Now, you can actually use them out of the box, but what it allows you to do is add your own unique requirements that you need for your application and uh, just basically build out, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants, build off the work of others. Uh, for example, and one of the ways that this that this works is um, something called Onyx. This is a, uh, this is a, a uh, call, what is it? Open Neural Network Exchange. And this is a standard for um, specifying machine learning models. And uh, it's a way to import and export uh, models between different um, between different machine learning frameworks. So, for example, you could take a model from TensorFlow and import it into uh, into ML.NET. I usually do an example of that, but I want to show you a different example today. Um, automated model selection. This is something that uh, this is kind of a, a hot area right now in machine learning, and the idea is that all of the work that we did before that wrote all that code, well, you don't, do you really have to write all that? No, uh, we actually are using, um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like meta machine learning in a way. So what we're going to do is we're going to just say, here's our data. You go find, here's our data. Go find out what is the best model to use for this, for this data. So not only does it train the model, it selects the, basically the algorithm that's going to use. Um, this is done uh, as far as ML.NET is concerned. There is a tool inside of Visual Studio for Windows uh, called the Model Builder. I believe it's still in preview. I'm not going to show that today because so you can go check that out if, if you like. I'm not going to show that today because I am, like I said, you know, with .NET Core and the uh, talk that I did yesterday morning about cross-platform .NET Core, uh, I am about the cross-platform experience. So uh, there is a tool uh, that you can use at the command line called uh, MLNet. And uh, this works everywhere, including Linux. Um, and all you have to do is, uh, and in fact, um, Model Builder works based off, of, Model Builder is kind of like a UI around MLNet um, or around AutoML, which is what ML.NET is giving you, um, giving you a window into. Uh, so there are three tasks that you can, uh, that you can, that we currently have available to us. So we can do classification, regression, and recommendation. And it'll go through, do all of the, um, select, train different models, select the best one based on the type of task that you've given it. And it'll even go through and give you a sample project um, that you can, uh, that you can run uh, or build off of. And uh, yeah, a model builder um, works off of AutoML as well. Okay, so let's take a look at this real quick. And I will tell you that this example takes three minutes to run. And again, it's a short one. So where's my Visual Studio code? Okay. And let's open up file. Melnet. All right. So here's our training data set that we're going to use. And like I said, we're, this one's going to be... Um, 
what we're going to do here is this one's going to be binary classification. So um, what we have over here, this is from uh, Wikipedia, uh, yeah, Wikipedia. And we have a whole bunch of comments. And then we also have a label for each one of them. This label is sentiment, where zero is um, the most negative that you can get and, pos and one is the most positive that you can get. Now here they just labeled them negative negative or positive outright. But what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, AutoML train a model and select the best model that it can uh, within 180 seconds to um, to be able to accurately predict the amount, the sentiment as a number between zero and one. It's still called binary. It's still, it's still a form of binary classification, but um, it's actually going to give us a number between zero and one. And the closer it is to one, that's how it's, it's more positive and the closer it is to zero is more negative. Okay. Um, to do that, first of all, we would need to install the .NET tool that uh, does this. I've already got it installed on this machine, so it doesn't matter. And then what I'm going to do is use this uh, command line um, here, this command line statement here. So I'm going to call, obviously, MLNet, tell it, well, actually, let's do this. Let's run MLNet, and so you can see. So the commands here, classification. So again, classification, regression, or recommendation. Now, if I just run... MLNet classification, it will give me uh, more options that I can that I can um, that I can use. So there are different things I can. So for example, um, actually this one has a header, so I probably should add has header to this. Let's see here, has header true. Um, and then I could you know I can tell it to do different things. Like I said, there's going to be a an, a full uh, a project that is that is generated. I could give the um, I could give the um, the name names for that. Um, I also I could also uh, specify testing data things like that. But anyway, this time I'm just going to use a single data set. Uh, what do I want to predict the label column and what's the maximum amount of time I want to allow for it? 180 seconds. Okay, so I'll copy this and paste it. And it's going to take about, again, it's going to take 180 seconds about, and it's going to give us the time. We're going to show us the progress. So um, if anybody wants to ask any questions, and don't don't be mic shy. I am okay. I, I will I will let people come on mic. That's fine. And it's going to give us, it's going to tell us the um, how long each one took. So for example, this one's called Average Perceptron OVA, and it did pretty good. SDCA maximum entropy did a little bit better, took a little bit longer. Okay, 1052, we'll have, yeah, we'll have plenty of time. And, and it'll keep track down here of, what, of what's the best one. Now, if I'm not, if I remember correctly, this third one takes most of the time. Actually, while that's training, we'll come back to that. We'll just go back and finish the slides up. How about? I'm not going to do a time filler like that. Um, okay. So what are the use cases? You, 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 you've seen the specifics. What are the use cases for ML.net? Um, when you Obviously, when you have proprietary algorithms. So if you have a, uh, an algorithm, or not necessarily an algorithm, but a proprietary workflow, so if you have a workflow that's specific that um, to, to your needs, something that um, creates a something that, again, that's specific to your app's requirements, that's what you, that you need to create by hand like that place to use MLNet. Uh, if you have domain specific data, like I said, there are lots and lots of data sets out there, but they're, but they're designed to be more generic. So if you have something that's, you know, like very industry specific um, and you need to train and you need to train a model on it, that's when you would um, also want to use something like MLNet, where you can get down and have get down into the details and have a lot of control. Privacy concerns: There are a lot of machine learning services in the cloud, but are they? You know, do they uh, do they meet uh, you know privacy and security uh, specifications? You know, like for example, HIPAA. Um, you know, or if you want to, or if you just want to keep all of the training on a particular device, you know, like with a phone or something. Um, that's where you would also use <clears throat> MLNet. Now, there are MLNet is not always the best choice. Uh, so there are other libraries out there, like I said, Scikit-Learn and TensorFlow. Um, depending on your needs, uh, or if you're, you know, if you if you don't know .NET, well, guess what? You know, you might you might use one of those. Um, but like I said, remember that like with TensorFlow, 
um, you can you can actually export a model to Onyx and then bring it in into into ML.NET. So you can use uh, TensorFlow along with ML.NET. Uh, the Azure Cognitive Services. So Azure has, a, like I said, uh, cloud services. Now Azure Cognitive Services. This is um, a set of uh, basically RESTful in, RESTful uh, APIs that expose very well trained models. Uh, so, for example, for facial recognition, all you do is you, you take a photo, you ship it up to Azure. Uh, Microsoft does some machine learning magic on it, uh, charges you a little bit of money, like you know fractions of a penny for a transaction, and then sends sends the data back to you. Uh, you know, sentiment analysis, what we're working on right now, that actually uh, Microsoft has solved uh, has, has solved that problem uh, for us. So that's something that you so that's so you know if, if all you need is you've got an app and you just need to uh, you know recognize are there pictures of cats in this image and that's all you need to do uh, it's going to it's probably going to be quicker and cost effective and more accurate to do with Azure Cognitive Services than with ML.NET uh, and then there's Azure Machine Learning which is uh, again gives gives you a gives you a little bit gives you actually a lot more control than Cognitive Services does. Uh, but again, you know, you may have the privacy concerns with the, uh, with everything being in the cloud. And also this is, this can get incredibly expensive. Um, I can easily spend several hundred dollars a month on this. Um, let's see here. Let's go back. Feel free to ask questions at any time, but, uh, let's go back and see how our, here we go. See how we did. Okay. So it trained. It looked at, uh, let's see here. There we go. This is what I'm looking for. So it looked at seven different, um, looked at seven different um, models. That's uh, not going to work. Okay, at any rate, this will work. Uh, looked at several, seven different models. It looks like, um, now because it's a small data set, there's probably not going to be a lot of difference in between. It looks like this one came out on top. Uh, like I said, the some of these, actually it wasn't the third one. It was the fifth one this time that took longer. And you can go through here and see different uh, different statistics, but it's basically it's going to tell us that this um, that this one, how it, whatever that means, is um, what was the winner. Now, also remember that I said that it will create a project for you. So here's this sample classification project over here. And what I'm going to actually do is cd into that, restart code in that project. Uh, yeah, save it. That's fine. And what should happen is I should get my prompt from Visual Studio. Come on, there we go. And we'll go ahead and restore the dependencies. And here's the model. So there's our so there's our zip file again. Come on, give it'll 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 come back. Uh, here is here are the classes again that we use for our uh, for our feature vector, and then what we're going to and then what we're going to predict. And here's just a, here's just a class that allows us to um, to use it to make to make a prediction. And then we got a little sample app over here that um, that uh, that's going to take it's going to take that that's going to take that data that we that take the data from that from that CSV file that TSV file, and then over here it'll create a new it'll create a new one uh, create a new sample from that and then use to make a prediction. Okay, let's go to our terminal. Come on. And do a .NET run just to prove that it does work. And I've got two minutes left. And what are you talking about? Oh, hang on. Hang on. I need to do it this way. Sorry. Okay. And over here. There we go. And you'll see right here that... Um, so, so what it's doing is... Do, again, it's doing the sentiment analysis. Um what was it? Yeah, yeah, right here. So it's saying that so it's saying it's more likely that this is uh, closer to zero than it is closer to one. So um, this is a confident score of whether it is how confident it is that it's negative and how confident it is that it's positive. And if you look at the comment, um, if it has rapist in it, it's probably going to be fairly negative. Okay. And I have oh, that's that has nothing to do with ML.net. That's actually a that's something else that that exception has nothing to do with ml.net okay um at least i at least if i recall correctly it doesn't uh has to do with i actually forget what it is but 
at any rate, generally I just remove that, but I didn't have a chance to, but today I didn't, um, I forgot to today. Okay. So at any rate, um, I'm right up against time and I have a, and anybody who knows me knows I am notorious for that. But uh, here's how you can contact me if you would like to uh, continue. What is this on GitHub? Uh, Brad, yes. Actually, all of those examples that, I, that I've been showing, um, I can post the slides to GitHub if you'd like. Uh, all these examples that I'm showing actually are just modifications uh, of Microsoft's examples. And the reason why I do that is because it's very difficult to come up with examples that you can just basically hit do the equivalent of hit F5 and run and be able to do more than one in the session or even be able to complete one, com, uh, complete one in the session uh, at all. So, um, yeah, so all the examples are up on, but I'll, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll post, uh, I'll post these on GitHub. I'll, tw I'll tweet it out. Here's my Twitter. And, uh, and I'll also put links to the, and I'll also put links to the, um, I'll put links in the readme to the, to the uh, samples directory. All right. Uh, well, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Andre. I appreciate it. Uh, so that's all I've got. I'll go ahead and stick around here for a few minutes. But uh, everybody, again, go look at TDEFCONF. We, um, you know, uh, we've got, I know we've got a data science talk in there. We got actually, we got, we've, we've actually got some data. We also got some, dot, we've got .NET, we've got Azure, uh, we've got uh, soft skills, uh, lots of, you know, like I showed you, lots of good speakers there and uh make sure to go see the sponsors uh and uh, everybody enjoy the enjoy the rest of the day all right thank you brad appreciate it